now it works. So let me, yeah, recording started. So we're good. <laughs> and then now try sharing your screen. I think it should work. Happy birthday. Okay, awesome. I think it's, I can see it and everything looks good. So I'm, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm just checking in right before the meeting starts. Um, I have class at 1230, but I will keep the recording going for those um, who want to look back at it. So it's recording on my computer. So I'm going to have it off here to the side um, and uh, have a good time at this workshop. You guys are going to learn a lot and um, just thank Dr. Haiti Otifor for dedicating her time today for the next hour. And feel free to ask any questions at any time. We have um, Keo here, who's one of our officers, so he'll be able to facilitate questions as well. And uh, best of luck, and thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Pay attention to your class now. <laughs> All right, we still have a few minutes before 12.30. We're going to wait. In the meantime, if there are any general questions, uh, let me know. I'm going to be here. We're going to start at 1231-ish. All right, I'm going to start today's workshop. So welcome, everyone. Today we are going to be working on filters workshop. Uh, I try to include introductory materials. We are going to try to start to slow, get up to speed, and then I hope to be able to talk about the passive filters, active filters, first order, second order. And then if we had time, 
uh, we are gonna uh, look into body plots and how we can make body body plots if there are any questions at any point put it in ch chat i try to uh, keep a, an eye on the chat of this meeting and uh, or you can unmute and ask me i try to stop at various points I already have a question in chat. It says, will you share this recording and the presentation? Yes, both of them will be shared to you by Brian. I think you have a Discord that you get connected to on that. So uh, he's going to share both the recording and the presentation that I'm going to send to him right after um, today's meeting. So we are going to start to slow. Uh, just by uh, identifying what filters are, we have we can categorize filters in many ways. One of the uh, more obvious ways, if 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 these filters are working on analog or digital signals, digital filters are the ones that use are used um, by digital devices. They are working on digital data and they're filtering those. And analog filters that are more common when you're dealing with uh, electronics. They are usually made by some sort of electronic component, op amp, resistor, capacitor, inductor, uh, or if you want to go with more uh, complicated filters, they can be made of transconductors, uh, more complicated blocks, and they are, they are capable of filtering continuous and analog signal mostly. We know what the difference between digital and analog. Digital is our word of zeros and ones. Analog are the data that are around us, environmental data, physiological data, that tend to present their values in, in terms of continuous uh, steps. And when we are designing filters, we have a goal in mind. We have a goal in mind to pass some frequencies, reject some frequencies. And this is going to be one of the main things that we're going to be exploring today. Uh, different categories of filters that are capable of working in different frequencies. And while I'm introducing Today's workshop, I will be using the, the few terms that you're seeing in this slide. I'm going to be talking about passive filters, active filters. When I'm designing passive filters, you're going to mostly see resistors, inductors, and capacitors. And when I'm showing you active filters, you are going to be seeing devices like op amps and capacitors and resistors. And if we, if time lets us, we are gonna move into body plots and do a filter analysis using body plots. Um, so first categorization of filters, I have already told you analog and digital. This is the second way that we can categorize different filters, active filters and passive filters. And these are more common when we are dealing with analog filters. Active filters are the filters that uh, are made not with passive element, are made with dynamic and active elements. They are the more advanced one in, in the newer technologies. We are more inclined to use active filters because they are um, active filters have a smaller space. They, if you want to design them, have them on your PCB, have them on, on a chip, on an integrated circuit. Though they are more complex to design, though they need outside resources to control them, maybe to tweak them, and though they are costlier to include, you're going to need an op amp instead of resistors and capacitors, they are more low power and the, the area is smaller. Passive filters, on the other hand, are much cheaper. RLC, you can make a range of filters and that, that's enough for it. Just resistor, capacitors, and inductor. Uh, passive element design is less complicated and they are usually a standalone apart from the power that you're getting, apart from the input signal that you're giving it. They don't need anything else. They, uh, most of the cases, they don't even need to be powered up. They're just passing your signals. And this is in reverse to active filters where they're using parts that are um, that need outside tweaking, that need outside power. 
Um, but again, passive filters, if you want to make them all great, if they, we want to tweak them, you have less control there. Um, active filters um, use R, L mostly and all pumps. Passive filters use R, L and C components. No other uh, parameters is used when we are designing passive filters. You're gonna see these two different groups. If I want to um, go into more details, have a list of advantages and disadvantages of active filters, here are a few that you are seeing in these pictures. It requires power supply. Input impedance uh, requiring power supply can be looked at as advantage and disadvantage. Disadvantage because you need outside resources. Advantage because you have more control. You have more control if um, this input signal has an issue, you can uh, limit the, the, the passing of the signal using the power supply. Um, two, two other advantages are input impedance in high is high and output impedance is low. In many of our devices, we do look at output in impedance and for many applications, we do favor having an output impedance in a device that is low. And let, let's make this interactive. Anyone know the reason? Why do we care about having the output impedance of the block that we're designing below? Why do we care about that? I'm gonna wait here for a second. If you want, you can unmute and tell me or put it in the chat. The question I'm asking is, uh, why do we care about having a low output impedance when we are designing analog devices? or when we are designing basically any device. Hi, I, I, this is uh, Andrew. I, I have to guess that uh, you wanna have more voltage um, on, the, on the output so you can have more load to be driven. That's exactly correct. Yes, when you have an output impedance, as you see here um, in the first line, uh, we have, less effect on the block that is gonna follow our filter. If we are having a high impedance device and we are trying to um, drive a low impedance device, it, a, a device that has an input that has um, also a high impedance, we are gonna cover that up. We are not gonna be able to drive the next stage correctly. But having a low output impedance give you this uh, availability of running devices with the variety of inputs. It's, it's kind of doesn't matter anymore what you're trying to drive. When you're working with active filters, uh, you're gonna see that our op-amp element gives you a very big gain. And this big gain can also get, uh, get to control the gain of the signal that you're outputting, which is a good add-on. Uh, all the parameters in our active filters can get, uh, can get tweaked easier than uh, passive filters. Um, when we are dealing with active filters and we want to see up to what frequency we can design our circuit, that is limited by uh, the, a slowest device that is usually your op amp and um, this is this is among the one of the uh, it's a slight disadvantage if you don't have good components for your active filter you are gonna suffer in term of uh, the frequency response in in term of your limitations and when you're designing active filters it's common to have feedback through uh, your supply voltage and that might cause uh, os oscillation. And since you are uh, tied to a power supply, the variation in the power supply um, uh, affect your uh, output. This is another disadvantage. Looking at passive elements, passive elements, inductor, capacitors, resistors, they are very bulky. 
uh, you are going to see that when we are designing filters, our frequency control depends on R and C, depends on usually the multiplication of R and C. If you are having like even a very big resistor of like 10 mega, if you want to reach the frequency of gigahertz, you are going to need capacitors that are like 1000 microfarad. And I, I'm not sure what is the biggest capacitor that you have seen, but can anyone tell me uh, of the capacitors that you have worked with in your lab? What is the biggest capacitor that you have worked with? What, what do you think is the biggest capacitor that is like available to us to work with? Uh, they have uh, low voltage, high uh, ca farad capacitors. We can get maybe 50 farads, like in a 2.7 volt package. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's about three watt hours. And, and how big is that? Uh, it's like maybe like two inches by four or five. It's yeah, two inches by four or five. It's not like if you are designing a washing machine, washing machine and you want to have a, a ground filter that Two inch by four inches doesn't seem like a big deal. But if you're trying to design a laptop that has like, that you can like communicate through, having a capacitor that is a few inches is, is impossible to have. So we cannot design communication filters in high frequency using big capacitor. And we cannot, we can also, uh, we are limited in the amount of resistors that we are putting. First of all, because again, resistors take a space. And second, because as you go bigger in the resistors, the um, accuracy of the resistors drop. We know that usually our the resistors that we work with in our lab has the accuracy, has the error rate of 10%. Uh, if you got like a very good a uh, packet of resistor, maybe 5%. Uh, if you want resistors with 2% error, that is very customized. You're gonna pay a fabrication place to build your resistors that are more accurate than that. So again, when you go high in resistors, this error rate increase as well. Hence the, your, your frequency that you're trying to design the filter in is gonna uh, decrease. Um, your output impedance on your passive filters is usually your output impedance is bigger, so it's very hard to drive low impedance devices. Um, adjusting parameters is almost impossible when you are having passive filter. You have to redesign your filter. You need to buy new new components and you need to um, adjust your frequency by changing your circuit. Passive filters are not that adjustable, but they have a few advantages. They're not restricted by the frequency response of your components. Usually resistors, capacitors, and don't um, do not have frequency limitation. The frequency limitation comes from the equations that governs them and, and we know them. It doesn't, whereas in, in an op-amp that you use when designing active filters, you are limited by the characteristics of your op-amp. When you're designing passive filters, there's no power supply, so no distortion from the power supply, and um, easy, easier to design, as I have mentioned. And uh, now let's look at different, let's, um, have our filters organized in terms of frequency that they pass. Uh, I'm gonna start with low pass filter. Low pass filters are the filters that, as you can see here, pass lower frequencies and they block higher frequencies. I'm gonna be explaining about the plot that you're seeing in this slides soon and we're going to be able to do calculation and extract this plot but let's see a few elements uh, first of all i'm seeing uh, my if i'm looking through the free this plot this horizontal axis is your frequency this vertical axis is your gain it's shown by m here sometimes it's shown by a uh, how much your signal is amplified 
and you're seeing that in the lower frequencies, it seems like I have some sort of gain. My, my signal is um, past, my signal is moving through. As I move forward in the frequency realm, my signal here is divided to one square root of two. My signal here is, um, sorry, it's multiplied by one over a square root of two or divided by a square root of two. Up to here, it seems like my signal is divided in the maximum gain that I have. It is divided in half and I'm gonna hit zero. So no matter what I had, as my input at the output, my signal is gonna be zero. Let me draw you it, this in terms of input and output. So let's assume that you are trying to pass a sinusoidal signal with the gain of, with the, with the amplitude of one, its maximum amplitude is one. Then you are working, if your sinusoidal signal has a frequency of, and again, we are gonna say what is low and what is high, but let's assume here that um, I have a 10 Hertz at plot, I have it here. Then I input this plot in a filter that has this response and we call this frequency response. What I'm gonna see in my output is the same sinusoidal signal that has the, the amplitude is now M zero. Now let's assume that I'm inputting a new uh, sinusoidal signal. Now my sinusoidal signal has the frequency of omega C. And again, this is omega. This is a way to show um, um, frequency in signal processing realm, realm. It's two pi multiplied by frequency. In many of our equation, this is much uh, easier to handle than frequency for us. When we are doing a Fourier transform, when we are doing uh, S or Z transformation, we love to deal with omega instead of um, uh, frequency, instead of F. Let's assume that now the frequency of my sinusoidal signal has changed and the frequency of this sinusoidal signal that I'm inputting to my filter is now omega C. Can you tell me what is like the maximum amplitude? What is the amplitude of my sinusoidal signal now at the output? What I'm gonna see here? instead of M. Yeah, go ahead. Um, will it be 70% of MO? Yeah, it's gonna be one over a square root of two and M. And this number is important for us because as Bali mentioned very nicely, it's 70% of our maximum amplitude. When our frequency response hit this space, we can see that the filter is kind of stopping to work, is, is stopping to pass the frequency, is stopping to pass my signal. And anything after this, if I'm designing a block and I have some sort of input after here, I would not trust the output. The output is going to be too small. It's going to be and not good enough to, to be moved away. So I'm gonna like, uh, um, I'm gonna care about where my signal starts falling below 70% of its maximum value. And again, if you raise, raise, raise your frequency and have the input, have this sinusoidal signal, now be very fast. Uh, the frequency is here. You can see that almost none of this sinusoidal signal is going to pass. I'm just going to probably see a zero. This is important for us when uh, we are designing loudspeaker speakers, uh, those high pitch noises that you could see at the background of a microphone. If you ever had like a very bad speaker and you, uh, apart from the voice of the person who is talking, you see it, you hear a high pitch noise. 
that's because your speakerphone didn't have a low pass, good low pass filters. Uh, tuning knob on many electric guitars have a low pass filter to filter any treble sound that might exist. Uh, looking at this, I want to come and make your attention into M maximum passband gain. That is the name of M and corner frequency omega C, where our signal is 70% of its maximum gain. And after that, it's the area that we say that the filter is off, the filter is disconnected. Uh, I'm going to pass over the next few ones a little bit uh, faster. Uh, the next one is high pass band. So high pass band, as the name gives, gives, gives it away, I'm not passing the lower frequency. I'm passing a higher frequencies. It passes high frequency, since, hence high pass, or this is a high pass filter. Uh, Audio amplifier, I keep saying audio amplifier because amplifiers have many different filters. They have low pass filters, they have high pass filters. Sometimes they have multiple stages or um, multiple stages following each other. You are gonna uh, see this in a couple of slides. So if we want a, a signal to pass, which has frequencies in the mid-range, we use passband frequencies. Passband frequencies, when you're designing them, need RLC. They are, uh, they have application in, um, again, I'm gonna say audio, audio filtering, when you want to uh, filter a narrow band and just make sure that the frequency that is in your, in mind gets passed and the rest of the band, the rest of the signal in the and the the rest of the signal in different frequencies are gonna be uh, suppressed. And this is a very interesting filter, the stop band or band reject filter. This filter passes the lower frequency, the higher frequency, and it blocks the middle, the middle range that you're seeing here. This filter is a good filter when you're dealing with optical designs. In optical designs, sometimes we care about the signals in a specific frequency. The middle range is usually the normal light that we are seeing. We want to block that and see optical um, waves that are in specific ranges. So um, optical filters are uh, common here. Raymond spectroscopy. This is a very interesting realm uh, in nano design. Do search this term if you want to learn more about this term. It's uh, when they uh, design nanotube and they want to, um, when they design a variety of nano devices, one of the devices that I have worked with and done Raymond spectroscopy through is designing nano tubes that can work like uh, electrodes, a small non-invasive electrodes that uh, are like needle but nanometer needles. If you wanted to look at those um, uh, nanotube structure form, we would do Raymond spectroscopy. Uh, Pre-amplifiers um, that want to make a noise bigger to eliminate them easier does uh, band pass or band reject filtering. Um, other name of this filter are T-notch or um, band elimination filter. So many names for this ones. All of them next to each other, low pass, band pass, high pass, and band, uh, low pass and high pass, band, band pass and band stop. If you want to see them next to each other, there's kind of wordplay, low pass filter, pass all the frequency below a known frequency and rejects all the frequency above a known frequency. Um, the 
70% of the signal is also seen here. It's called minus three dB point. I had a comment in, in chat pointing to this. If you get the log of, so we said that this one is one, this, this portion that is important for us is one over a square root of two of our maximum gain. If you calculate this, if you get the log of this, you're going to see that the multiplication of one over a square root of two get translated into minus three dB, minus three decibel. And that, that conversion comes from getting the log of our amplification, getting the log of our transfer function. Uh, so yeah, this is a minus three dB point as well. A high pass filter pass all the frequencies above a known frequency, reject all below. You can see band pass and band stop next to each other as well. A pass all frequency apart from uh, out bands for band pass, reject all frequency in the middle and pass the corners for uh, band stop. Questions here? We're gonna step into the circuit from the next slide. All right, and you have seen uh, when we are doing filter design, it's very common to see the ideal form of filters that looks like pulses, but just have in mind that these are not ideal forms. There are no ways that you can design filters looking like this. And uh, filters usually like looks like this more uh, gra gradient change from low to high, as you have been seeing in these uh, plots as well. The dashed line uh, are the idealized one and the blue line is closer to reality. So just have in mind, real filters aren't the steps, They're, they have gradient changes. Now let's try to design them with resistors and capacitor. And again, all of this, if you have taken any electronic class and uh, you're able to do knot calculation, you're able to do um, loop calculations, you can extract the transfer function of any of these filters. No need to memorize them. I'm gonna start by looking here at the low pass filter. So in this low pass filter, if I want to write a node equation here, the node voltage here is VO. This I'm gonna assume as zero, I'm gonna assume as ground. When I'm working with circuits that have R and C, and I want to write down node voltages, if you remember, we would like to convert our capacitor to some sort of dealable element. Capacitors value change with frequency, we know that. We don't, as we want to see the circuit in different frequency, we want to write down capacitors, impedance, capacitors, resistance in different frequencies. It's called capacitance impedance as a function of frequency. I'm not gonna go into details on that. Let, let's just accept that for us to be able to deal with frequent with capacitors as a resistive element, as a, an element who is a function of voltage and current. We're gonna write it as one over J omega C. This is, uh, again, remembering that omega is 2 pi f, showing us that this capacitor, as we aim for it, will block frequency of zero and will pass higher frequencies. It will block DC, the, the aim of frequency is to um, block sudden voltages and then pass higher frequency. Let's write down the nodal equation. This, I'm gonna just deal with it as a resistance now, as, an, as a block that has an impedance. VO uh, over what I'm seeing here, one over J omega C for this part. 
and then VO minus VI over R. I'm gonna try to organize this. I'm gonna uh, have V, I'm gonna multiply everything by R. I'm gonna have VO R. I'm gonna keep one over J omega C plus VO minus VI is equal to zero. I'm gonna take, take VI to the other side. I'm gonna take VO out. I'm gonna have R one over J omega C plus one. Here, I wanna extract how output works based on input. So what I wanna do is I wanna have a trans, something called a transfer function, transfer function of VO over V in. And I'm almost there here. I just need to divide everything by V in. I'm going to have V O R uh, and I'm going to bring J omega C up, J omega C plus one. Uh, that's going to be it. I divided the both sides to one plus R J omega C. And that, as you can see here, looks like this. If you remember voltage division, it can be done much easier. Uh, remembering from our 211 classes, you could write a voltage division equation saying that the voltage drop over this compared to this would be uh, what person, what portion of the resistances that you're seeing here. Writing that, you can say that the VO is one over J omega C voltage drop compared to R plus one over J omega C voltage drop multiplied by VN. Now that I want VO over VN, the voltage drop calculated can help me. It's one over J omega C plus the addition of resistances together. But then again, if you don't remember this, it's fine. It's fine. You can write down the nodal voltages and extract the exact same thing here. Questions here? So what does this transfer function tell us? Let's uh, remember that omega is two, I said that omega is our two pi f, is the relation of our capacitor to the frequency. Looking at my low pass filter, and if I put f as zero, if I put f as zero, uh, imagine if f is zero in this equation, if F is zero, what would be VO over V in? You can put it in chat. It's one. So, uh, and let's uh, assume if F goes to infinity, if F is a very, very big number, what would be VO over V in? Yeah, zero. So, I, I have the correct answer. If VO over V in four frequencies of zero, the gain is one. My input is going to be equal to output. No attenuation, no uh, drop. But for frequencies that are very big, for Fs that are very big, my VO over V in is gonna be zero, meaning that no matter what input is, my output is just gonna be zero. This was what I had for the pass filter. At the small frequencies, my um, gain is big. My gain is as big as the DC gain that I give it. If there is no DC gain, it's one. In higher frequencies, it's gonna be zero. If I want to draw this more realistically, and it's uh, in some frequencies, in lower frequencies, my gain is good. My gain passes the signal. In lower frequency, it's going to fall to zero. Low pass filter. We designed it using R and C. If you want to control the omega, the frequency that this happens, 
that signal will be reduced by to 70% of the signal, you control it with RNC. You can see RNC has the say here on what is the frequency that you're seeing. Same thing can, so here is low pass filter. Uh, the controlling element is one over RC. We control well where minus 3 dB happens, when where 70% of the signal happens. Same thing for high pass. Um, just write a note here. You're going to get the same uh, equation here. Here, if my F, let's go again with F equals to zero and F being very big. If F is equal to zero, what is VO over VN? If F is zero, VO over V in would be zero over one plus zero. If F is infinity, I'm gonna have a very big number here, like one ten thousand million, and here is one plus ten thousand million. It's gonna be the same numbers. They're gonna get. Uh, simplified and VO over V in is going to be one. Proving that I have this form. This is the form that I'm going to get with this um, high pass filter. Now let's take a look at band pass filter. I don't want to run out of time, but I want to write down the equation for this real fast. So I'm going to, uh, when I'm dealing with capacitors, I write them as J omega C. If you have many omegas, it's going to be more um, difficult to handle them. So we have a, a realm called S parameter realm where our C are SC and our Ls are LS. Now, both of them are impedance elements, LS and one over SC. I'm going to write down the node element here, VO over R is the current that passes through here. I'm going to write down that current and those added together is going to be zero. VO minus V in divided by all the impedance elements that I'm seeing here, J omega C or CS. Are gonna be uh, the impedance elements that I'm seeing here. Um, Multi, trying to tidy this up, you're going to have VO over SC plus VO SL plus RVO minus RVN. I wrote that very really bad. RV in. Uh, try to tidy this up, VOs to one side, VOs to the other side. You are going to be able to extract this if you uh, assume higher frequencies and lower frequencies. For this one, you're going to see that for lower frequency, this is zero. You're going to have zero. For infinite frequencies, you're going to have one over infinity, which is going to be zero as well. So for lower frequency, higher frequency, you're going to get zero. For the middle frequencies, you're going to be able to pass the signal. 
Same thing for the band, the stop filter, writing the node voltages, driving them. You're gonna have the equation that you're seeing here at the high and low if S is zero, if your frequency is zero, you are gonna get one, it's gonna be um, this one, one over LC, one over LC for F equal to zero, your gain is one. For F is equal to infinity, your gain is one again. It's gonna be infinity over infinity, S over two over S over two. So for high and low frequencies, you're passing, your gain is one. For middle frequencies, you're gonna see that you have zero over something that is bigger than zero. You're gonna have, uh, you're gonna have almost zero. Questions here? Why does the high pass have the cap first capacitors? Yeah, the high pass have the capacitors first, the low pass have the resistors first. And again, the idea behind it is building the transfer function, building what you are seeing here. This is what we are aiming to build and from aiming to build that, we come up with this circuit. This is how this circuit is made from the transfer function, not the other way around. We are just proving that this circuit satisfy the transfer function, but good question. Uh, when you're designing band stuff filters, there is something that you need to take care of. Uh, have it in the back of your mind and you, uh, if you're interested, you can look more into it. Have it in back of your mind that whenever we are designing filters, we need to make sure that all of our poles, all of if you get your denominators equal to zero, whatever you're achieving here need to be in left side of the plane. Need to be here. Your denominator equals to zero. In control, if you have taken Dr. Chasiakos's class, any poles on the right half plane will make your circuit resonate. Just have this in the back of your mind. Couple of important points about designing filters that you we have seen so far. We have looked at corner frequency. Corner frequency was the omega C, where your attenuation of signal is, you have already lost 30% of the signal. And after that point, we, uh, assume our signal to be not, not big enough anymore. In our calculation, after that point, the filter is off. And M0, M0 is your DC gain, is how big your maximum amplitude is. So these two are important. Bandwidth is a very important term when it comes to designing circuit. Bandwidth of the filter, is where it's passing the signal. So where the signal is my maximum and where the, until the signal is bigger than 70%. All the orange areas in the pictures that you're seeing here is the pass bands of our signal. And the bandwidth is that area for our low pass filter. Our bandwidth is zero to omega C. Our bandwidth is omega C. For our pass band filters, which pass between omega C1 and omega C2, our pass band is this, this here in between. For our high pass filter and band reject filter, it's easier to talk about the stop band or the rejection band. The rejection band of high pass filter is zero to omega C. The pass, its pass band is omega C until infinity, until bigger frequencies. Same thing with um, band reject filters. Here's uh, band pass and a stop band, band reject marked for each of these plots. And let's move questions on the passive filters. Are we ready to move to active filter? I, I could do a question. Um, sure. Depending on the uh, load or on the signal, let's say, uh, 
does the wattage rating of, let's say, the resistor have to equate only to a certain percent of the load, like 70%? Yeah, so I mean, yeah, it, yeah. So uh, again, based on the circuit that you are looking at, yeah, that's, that can be actually your output voltage. So the, if you hear, for example, in high pass filter, the voltage of the resistance that you are monitoring is your output voltage. V, it's gonna start from its maximum gain. It's gonna keep dropping as you go higher. It's gonna, uh, start with zero, it's going to keep increasing until you hit 70% of a signal at a high frequency, and it's going to be one after that. Cool. cool. So, 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 so you can kind of correlate the duty cycle um, to the rating of the, um, of the component itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, that, that's a very good point. Yeah, thanks. All right, let's look at a couple of active filters. And again, now that you know what is low pass, what is high pass, it does, it's just like doing the calculation, writing the nodal analysis and trying to put zero, put a mid-range frequency, put a high range frequency and do the calculation. For this one, let's again try by writing a knot here. And let me ask you, uh, it seems like I don't have the voltage here, but I actually do. What is the voltage here? It's a constant voltage. Uh, no, it's not V. So it's dependent into op amp and mirroring and the two input of the op amp. So this is our virtual ground. Yeah, zero volts, nice job. This is our virtual grant. All pumps tend to keep mirror these two voltages. This is zero volt. And again, you can write down your nodal analysis however you want. I like to start from here. Start, uh, write this branch, write this branch, add them together, putting equal to zero. Uh, and again, it's just how you are more used to. Let me write down this zero minus VO over RFB plus this branch, zero minus VO over one over J omega C plus now this one, zero minus V in over R in. And, um, there are better ways to write this. Again, I, I try to do like the easiest one that usually learn in electronics. I'm gonna try to simplify this. It's RFB plus minus V over J omega C is equal to V O over R in. I'm gonna try to make it one a step easier. Minus, I'm gonna take V O out. Here I have one over RFB plus one over J omega C, and I have V in over R in. As always, I want to find the transfer function. The transfer function of this is when I calculate VO over VN, I can write down um, VO over VN. I, I still have this negative here. I'm gonna move it to the other side to be more, uh, to work more easier in this RN over uh, one over RFB plus one over J omega C. I can, uh, I could have a start of simplifying from the start. It would have been much easier. So just you do that. But if you make this, uh, simplify this, multiply by J omega C denominator and numerator, numerator and have the R in down, you are gonna get RFB over 
R in plus J omega C R F B. This is going to be the uh, simplified simplified equation. And you have a negative here. This negative is actually important. What does this negative tells me? If I have uh, a signal at the input, what does this negative uh, shows? The output is 180 degrees out of phase. Yeah, the output inverted. is inverted. That, that's a very good analogy. The output is inverted. But other than that, if I take the DC values out, if I try to change this to be at the denominator, be one plus J omega C, if I take R in out, I'm gonna have V O over V in. I'm going to have RFB over V in this uh, over R in. This is my DC gain. And then I'm going to have one over one plus J omega C R. And this R is again RFB over R in. So looking at the low pass filter again, I like my low pass filter to be one over one plus j omega rc if anything is multiplied to this it's my dc gain from this active filter you actually get the same thing you get one over one plus j omega c multiplied by an r so though i'm making the filter differently this is a still a low pass filter a low pass filter that blocks anything high frequency if my omega has high is high frequency it's gonna be my transfer function is gonna show zero if my omega is lower frequency my transfer function is gonna give me the dc gain so dc gain low frequency zero high frequency low pass filter same thing for high pass filter you can write that write down the knot here if you have it um, organized, you are gonna see that this high pass filter is, is exactly gonna have J omega CR over one plus J omega CR, maybe multiplied by a gain, a DC gain that you can control by changing R in, RFB and C. The bandpass filter, if you want to write down the equation is a little bit more complicated, but again, doable. Make sure, make, make sure that you know all of these are zero. All of these are zero. So you can write down the equation and the band stop filter will give you the one over RCs so that you have an S to the power of two or omega to the power of two. Uh, then designing active filters, what we care about is uh, having a good amplifier because no matter what you put as R and C if you are dealing with an amplifier that doesn't have good characteristic if the amplifier only works until 10 megahertz and then I stop working you cannot make a high pass filter with this no matter what you put with R and C your amplifier gain is gonna um, suppress that, is gonna eliminate working in higher frequency. So when designing active filters, especially in very high frequencies or very low frequencies, make sure of the limitations of your op amp. Other than that, the plot of uh, active filters just follow the rules of passive filters. We care about the cutoff frequency. That is the 3 dB that is less than the maximum of our signal. And the bandwidth that is calculated from where your signal is maximum and when it gets smaller than 3 dB. Questions on active filter? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so for the bandpass and the band stop, um, 
the last op amp for both? Is that just to, <laughs> it's a weird way of saying it, but invert what's been inverted? Uh, so pretty much bring it back to be um, in phase? So this actually, this third one, and I'm not sure why the slides really like to have inverting active filters, but we're inverting our signal once here, inverting it twice and inverting it a third time. This one just adds a gain. This one just adds the gain of RF over RI and inverts it. This is just a normal gain amplifier. Thank you. Yeah, but, but good, good eye. It was a good catch. Right. When you're dealing with, um, uh, when you are trying to design a filtering scheme for a signal, just note that there are many instances that you're going to be needing to filter it multiple times. Filter it with the lower part of the signal, amplify it, filter it for the higher part of the signal. It's very common to have multiple orders, multiple poles, multiple zeros, and having many filters right next to each other. There's also second order and third order filters that you're gonna see in the next slide. All the filters that we had so far at each step, we only saw one capacitor. But for two pole or three pole filters, you are gonna see few capacitors connected to a single op amp. To be able to do the calculations for that, again, um, calculations are gonna be harder. You're gonna be needing to have like a very big piece of paper, do the calculation by hand if you like. But at the end, what we want to extract from that as always is VO from V over V in our transfer function. And these second order filters are gonna have omegas to the powers of two. When you simplify that, we like to simplify second order filter to match the um, outcome that you're seeing in this paper, to have an omega n and to have the q. And the, again, this q, it's, I, I do the calculations for this in my 532 class. This Q is R1, R2 plus C, R3, R4. It's a very big, big block of R and Cs. But then again, it all depends on the, line, the passive elements and calculating based on that. The Q that you're seeing here, we like to simplify it like this because it gives us a very good information. It gives us the information of the Q factor. The Q factor is how good and selective your filter is. And the omega N, which is your resonance frequency, the frequency that your filter will resonate. Uh, and again, it's not this, if you have three poles of the filter, you're gonna have three capacitor connected to the same knot. And this is very, it's not very uncommon to have multiple filters following each other, each targeting a different part of frequency at a different level, at a different gain. It's 1.30, I'm gonna stop here. I didn't get to go through the body plots, but I have, I'm gonna send you the slide and this YouTube video that I have posted here, this YouTube video goes through this body plot very nicely. If you're interested in being able to draw body plot equation, watch this. And again, it goes through a very interesting examples of body plot. I make sure to highlight this in the slide when I'm sending it to you. Question for me. I, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, is there a book um, uh, that you would recommend if we wanted to further look into um, filter design? Yeah, sure, sure. Let me check. Uh, I, I do work on a few books. I have them here, but I'm pretty sure that there are two. Let me make sure of the new uh, edition of those books. And uh, I'm going to include that information in my email to Brian as well. Thank you. Yeah, and do, those books are where for when I was an undergrad. So I don't think that you're gonna find them. <laughs> more questions for me. Uh, 
All right. Thank you all for attending.